Thank you. And we now turn to topical questions. And question number one, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government for its reaction to the findings of the GMB Union report on North Sea decommissioning costs. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. As made clear in our programme for government, the Scottish Government recognises that the opportunities presented by decommissioning, and we are committed to ensuring Scotland is best placed to take advantage of these and to build on the considerable offshore decommissioning work already won by Scottish-based firms. Yesterday, the Minister for Business, Innovation and Energy and I hosted a round table with industry representatives focused on the challenges and opportunities presented by decommissioning and further engagement is ongoing. Scottish Enterprise are developing a decommissioning action plan due to be published by the end of the year and we are also working closely with Scottish ports and harbours to understand their capabilities and to identify how we can help them to take advantage of the opportunities arising from the energy sector. A priority of the Government is to encourage the industry to maintain the infrastructure that exists already in the North Sea so that the value of oil and gas reserves can be maximised. The GMB report notes that the current structure of decommissioning tax relief is, in their words, severely restricting the potential for new entrants with, a more, with more agility and a lower cost base to extend the life of many UKCS fields. The Chancellor's autumn statement presents an ideal opportunity to offer the industry the support and clarity it deserves. The UK Government must provide support in widening access to decommissioning tax relief to ensure that the full potential of late-life assets can be realised, as called for both by the Scottish Government and the industry. Gillian Martin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answers. As mentioned, tomorrow the Chancellor gives his autumn statement where he will have the opportunity to outline vital support for the North Sea oil and gas industry. Can I ask what representations have been made to the UK Government on decommissioning tax relief? Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Constitution wrote to the Chancellor of the Exchequer on 13 November calling for the autumn statement to improve the access to decommissioning tax relief. The letter also highlighted that addressing the fiscal barriers to asset transfers could extend field life, the field life of assets and reduce decommissioning costs. In addition, I have made representations to the previous Chief Secretary of the Treasury about loan guarantees for infrastructure within the North Sea. Julian Martin. Yesterday, the Scottish Government signed the Aberdeen City Region deal, which includes investment for the expansion of Aberdeen Harbour. Can the, Min can the Cabinet Secretary update Parliament on how these plans are progressing and how increased harbour capacity will help the North East of Scotland to capitalise on the opportunities of decommissioning in the North Sea? Cabinet Secretary. As the member says, we did indeed sign the Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire City deal yesterday, which comprised around £250 million of support uh, equally split between the UK Government and the Scottish Government, and ad an additional £254 million was also committed by the Scottish Government in relation to capital activities. Uh, the Aberdeen Harbour expansion has both regional and national significance, and it will strengthen the harbour's key role in supporting the economy in the North East, in particular the oil and gas sector. Aberdeen Harbour Board has progressed discussions with the preferred bidder for the implementation of the works. Scottish Enterprise are in the process of engaging with Scottish ports regarding their interest in providing facilities for decommissioning activity, and are also investigating what can be done to make Scottish locations more competitive for these types of projects. A decommissioning action plan is scheduled for publication in December 2016. Jane the Cabinet Secretary will have seen the report from the GMB this week that makes clear that the Scottish Government and the UK governments must be taking action to make sure that Scottish workers get these jobs and all the work does not go to other countries. The report very clearly calls for an urgent investment fund between the UK and Scottish governments. Can the Cabinet Secretary please tell me what plans he has for such an investment fund, separate from any city deal uh, arrangements? Cabinet Secretary. You know, what we are concentrating on currently is trying to, first of all, identify, as a GMB report seeks to do, the size of the opportunity that is there. It is quite clear 
uh, from a factor of 46 to 1 that the massive amount of expenditure and decommissioning will be concentrated on uh, plugging wells and abandoning wells. That's where the high-value jobs, where the high-value work comes. Of course, there is a possibility for taking top sides and deconstructing th those um, in harbours and ports as well. So we want to understand the level of that opportunity, the level of uh, investment that would be required to make sure we can tap into that opportunity. And the other thing I would say is that although, of course, it's urgent that we do this, it's also true to say, as the industry will tell you, that the cost reduction activities which they have been involved in has now pushed out quite substantially their decommissioning plans in many cases. And what they are now concentrating on in those cases is uh, maximising the economic recovery from those facilities. So we will keep very close to the industry, but also talk, Paul Wheelhouse uh, uh, and I discussed this yesterday, we will talk further with both the trade unions and those ports and harbours which are interested in taking on this work and make sure it is appropriate at the time these opportunities become available. Alexander Burnett. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary support the decommissioning programme put forward by Shell UK in the Brent field and recognise that the real growth to be captured in the North East is through learning and innovation, uh, supported by the Oil and Gas Technology Centre, funded by the CTDL yesterday, and which I visited yesterday, uh, and exporting these skills globally? Cabinet Secretary. I think that's a very good point, and the, the, the point that the member makes about the Brentfield, just to go back to the point I've just made in response to Jenny Mara, is that there are over 100 companies active, uh, many of which are Scottish companies involved in that process uh, in the Brentfield. So a huge amount of economic activity going on in terms of decommissioning right now. And the member is also right to say, through the Oil and Gas Technology Centre, that if we can produce the innovation that's required and also provide um, collaboration between the different actors that are interested in this work, then we can develop such expertise that can be sold around the world to the benefit of companies in the northeast of Scotland. Lewis MacDonald. Clearly, technologies in the Oil and Gas Technology Centre and elsewhere can play a, a key role uh, in taking forward decommissioning. But does the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge that the time for action is now and that the urgency of uh, the opportunity is that Scotland has to act quickly if it is to gain uh, those uh, opportunities at this stage while uh, uh, companies are making their decommissioning plans going forward. Secretary. I would agree with the member that we do have to act now, but I would make the point again, as I did to Jenny Mara, that the industry themselves says that, say that their plans have changed quite substantially. Because of the lower price of oil, they have had to get involved very substantially in cost reduction. That has also led to some more marginal fields being uh, pushed further out in terms of the length of time that they will be exploited. So we will respond to what the industry is doing. That is the way to do it, to try and identify the opportunity. And of course, there are opportunities which are there, but it is important to recognise a lot of this is going on right now, many high-value jobs in Scottish companies and UK companies uh, are being sustained by the decommissioning activity, which Scotland and the UK has done extremely well in. At the same time, we should, of course, be aware of future opportunities as well. Question number two, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will consider holding a public inquiry into deaths and childbirth in NHS Ayrshire and Arran. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. Well, the, the death of any mother or baby in childbirth is a tragedy for all involved. Following concerns raised by local parents, I have asked Healthcare Improvement Scotland to undertake a rapid review of the processes Ayrshire and Arran have in place to review and capture learning from significant adverse events and to look at the internal investigations that the Board have undertaken. I have offered to meet with the parents concerned on conclusion of uh, that process. I should say that we do have the lowest ever recorded maternal mortality rate and stillbirth rate in Scotland. Last year, 88 babies were born alive as a result of the processes that we have in place to drive down the stillbirth rate compared with the 2011 figures. But we are certainly not complacent and a programme of work is underway led by the Scottish Government Stillbirth Group that I established and through our Scottish Patient Safety Programme to better understand the incidence and causes of stillbirth to continue to drive the rate of stillbirths down further. Jamie Green. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. Uh, we welcome yesterday's announcement uh, into an HIS review and naturally our condolences are with all the families involved in these cases. But in the tragic case of the Morton family, they wrote to the Minister in January of this year, then again in May, my colleague uh, Brian Whittle followed this up with a letter in June, and finally a one-page cursory response was received from the Minister in July. In her response, the only reference to a review 
is that of a pre-existing government review into maternity services announced the year before. So may I ask the Cabinet Secretary, why has it taken FOIs, whistleblowers, a BBC investigation and negative press headlines and indeed the lodging of this topical question in Parliament today before the Cabinet Secretary finally accepted that this was a serious problem and announced a formal review? Cabinet Secretary. Can I say first of all that some of the, at least uh, three of the six cases that have been mentioned so far predate the, his review that was carried out in 2012. Um, and let me just go back for a second to the, the his review in 2012, because there was a, a detailed review of the adverse event management uh, of, in the spring of 2012 at the request of the then Cabinet Secretary. And some improvements have been made. And I think it's important to say that within Ayrshire and Arran, as well as the rest of Scotland, the, uh, the deaths of neonatal babies and the rate of uh, stillborns and indeed maternal deaths have reduced. So that's something that uh, we should acknowledge. However, what I want Healthcare Improvement Scotland to do is to look at some of the concerns raised by the families about the processes and procedures followed or not followed by Ayrshire and Arran. What I want to assure myself of is that what was supposed to happen in each of those cases did happen, and if not, we need to know why that was the case, and to reinforce with Ayrshire and Arran, and indeed any other health board, that when there is a significant uh, adverse event, that there are very clear processes that has established that should be followed, and indeed, if it comes to a, a, ref, a reference of a case uh, to, the, to the Crown, that there are very clear guidelines there as well. I want to assure myself in all of those cases that those processes were followed, and if not, then action will be taken to make sure that the lessons are learned from that. Jamie Green. Uh, again, I, I reiterate that we do welcome this specific review, but we also want to make the point that all potential options for audit and scrutiny should be on the table, including the option of a third party inquiry. And I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary will agree to that suggestion. The issue that a lot of people have, Presiding Officer, is that four years ago, a similar HIS review into North Air, uh, NHS Ayrshire and Arran uh, made very specific recommendations on what could be done to improve the reporting of significant adverse events. Previous reports also flagged problems around fetal heart monitoring, for example. But staff shortages are presenting, uh, preventing midwives from be, being able to attend these mandatory training sessions. And the Health Board is still failing to carry out serious adverse event reviews. I ask, therefore, in addition to this HIS inquiry announced yesterday, what further measures the government is taking to ensure that any recommendations coming out of an inquiry or review are not just acknowledged, but acted upon? And if the Cabinet Secretary will take personal responsibility for, for overseeing this process? Cabinet Secretary. Well, just let me uh, remind the member that when the first review in the spring of 2012 was carried out, uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland developed a framework and a programme of reviews. So it was to try and ensure that there was a consistency and approach to managing adverse events. So that national framework was published in uh, September 2013, and then it was refreshed again in April 2015. And in 2015, Healthcare Improvement Scotland also held a series of progress meetings with boards to understand how they were continuing to implement the national framework. So there was action that came out of that review in 2012. New procedures were established and indeed his went back to make sure that those processes were being carried out. What I need to understand about Ayrshire and Arran is in those cases where families have raised concerns, were those procedures and processes followed, bearing in mind that half of the cases predated that review in 2012, and that's what we need to know. Now, in terms of any action after his report to me, we need to wait and see what his say before we judge whether further action is required. But I would expect all boards, and I've asked uh, my officials to make sure that all boards are reminded of the processes that are required to be carried out when there is a significant adverse event, and also to remind them of the guidelines for referrals of any cases to the Crown Office. Now, the member also mentioned the issue of staffing. Uh, what I can say um, 
is that we'll, we have an increased uh, number of uh, uh, midwifery staff in the uh, NHS. Uh, there's a, a 4.1% increase in the number of uh, midwives uh, over the last few years since uh, September 2007 to June 2016 and overall NHS Scotland meets the Royal College of Midwives recommended midwife to birth ratio but we also uh, are aware that sometimes there are uh, challenges in particular areas but in Ayrshire and Arran Ar uh, they have recently recruited six additional midwives to the team and are planning further recruitment later in the year. The national review that is coming to me in the next few weeks is also looking at and um, working with the Royal College of Midwives to make sure that the models of care being delivered in our maternity and neonatal units are uh, the best that they can be. And that was also looking at what the workforce tools should be in taking that forward. And I'm very happy to make that review available to Parliament. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the presiding officer for his indulgence and I urge the cabinet secretary to make this inquiry wider and deeper. On a due date in 2009, my wife Patricia, having been sent home and been physically sick, was finally admitted to the Southern General Maternity Unit despite their protests. A consultant, junior doctor and two midwives examined her that day. Despite being 41, a first-time mother and extreme pain from head to toe, no one picked up her preeclampsia. She was given morphine and put to bed. Overnight, her baby died and had to be delivered by caesarean. Patricia's liver ruptured and she spent 19 days in intensive care and high dependency. For 20 months, we asked Greater Glasgow and Clyde to explain how they'd prevent such a failure of care reoccurring and impacting other lives. They blanked us and when we were thereby forced to take legal action, hired a QC wasting thousands in taxpayers' money to defend the indefensible. It took five years before they eventually conceded this year. What will the Cabinet Secretary do to ensure other people in Ayrshire, Glasgow and elsewhere in Scotland are not treated as badly when they experience such a tragedy? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say um, to, to Kenny Gibson, obviously, that um, the, the way that that case was handled and the experience that Patricia Gibson had was absolutely appalling and indeed the whole family had. And uh, we would expect all health professionals to treat anyone who has suffered any bereavement with care, dignity and respect. Clearly that didn't happen in that case. Um, we should um, learn the lessons from that case. If Kenny Gibson wants to follow up with me um, further around uh, some of the issues ar arising from that case, um, then I would be happy uh, to do that and to make sure that through the national review and the work that Healthcare Improvement Scotland is undertaking, that we make sure that cases like that, where possibly can be avoided, are avoided. And I would be happy to have a further discussion with Kenny Gibson about that. And that's Sarwar. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I start by saying that our thoughts and condolences go to all the families affected and indeed to Kenneth and Patricia Gibson. I thought uh, Mr Gibson made a very powerful and indeed emotive case that will have touched all of us in the chamber uh, today. I welcome the announcement of a review in Ayrshire and Arran, but I do believe the Cabinet Secretary should go further. Uh, the BBC investigation found that there were 25,000 or more than 25,000 adverse incidents since 2011, including the death of 26 uh, newborns, 79 stillbirths and three mothers, two losing uh, their life. Uh, these figures are heartbreaking and our thoughts are with every single family who has been affected by the death of a child. Uh, the investigation also revealed that 500 incidents were related to staff shortages and more than 100 due to delays in treatment. It is increasingly clear that there is more and more pressure being put on our uh, frontline NHS staff who are doing an amazing job and with thousands of posts going unfilled in our health service. Now, I've raised the issue of workforce planning with the health secretary before, and she's right to say about the numbers in terms of uh, the NHS workforce, but the reality is that vacancies amongst our nurses and midwives are actually increasing uh, in Scotland. So I'd ask her, in light of this investigation, if she'll extend the review to look at staffing more widely across all maternity units in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. 
Um, can I first of all um, address the issue um, that Anna Sarwar raised about adverse events, the 25,000 that have been uh, cited uh, by the BBC? They, of course, range from minor adverse events such as slips, trips, bumps, um, ad administrative errors, right through to very, very significant adverse events. So I think it's important to make sure that people listening to this understand that, uh, that, that we are not talking about 25,000 significant adverse events. Now, every adverse event should be investigated and lessons learned from all of those 25,000. However, let me focus on the significant adverse events because we absolutely want to ensure that we, um, through the patient safety programme, reduce and continue to reduce those significant uh, adverse events and avoidable deaths. And let me reiterate what I said earlier. Through the patient safety programme, which has been operating now for a number of years, we have seen now the record, the lowest levels of stillbirth on record. We have seen the lowest neonatal deaths uh, on record, and we have seen maternal deaths decrease as well. So those really, really significant uh, adverse events, the worst kind, we have seen uh, huge progress being made through that patient safety programme. Um, so that it is fair to say that our maternity and neonatal units are safer now than they were four or five years ago due to that programme of patient safety work. And we should thank our, our frontline staff for the work they have done in achieving that. However, we absolutely mustn't be complacent and that work will continue. It's overseen by uh, external scrutiny. So there is a, a group called Embrace, which looks at units across the whole of the UK. And every year they do a report and in that report, it highlights any unit that is above the uh, average for deaths and those, that information is out there in the public domain and those units would then be expected to address why they have a higher than average level of avoidable deaths. And that is something that is a very, very important external scrutiny. The duty of candour will also add another layer of external scrutiny to that. In terms of the workforce, uh, as I said in the answer to the previous uh, question about uh, uh, workforce, the overall NHS Scotland meets the Royal College of Midwives recommended midwife to birth ratio. Uh, and it is important that we make sure through the national review and the work that we're doing with the Royal College of Midwives that those workforce tools, which uh, are, are very important to make sure you've got the right staffing level in the right units, are applied. Where there are vacancies, clearly that is uh, a challenge, but we are working with boards to overcome that. There are more midwives out there. We've had four years of increase in student midwife numbers, and we now have new uh, midwives coming out into training and into post, and that's something that we will continue to support. There's a huge amount of interest in this subject. I'm only going to take one more question. There's no more time, I'm afraid. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I've been working with my uh, constituents, Mr. Logan and Ms. L and, uh, Mr. Morton and Miss Logan, uh, in investigating the tragic death of their son, Lucas. And in scrutinising action plans produced from a previous root cause analysis review, we were shocked to discover that areas recommended for improvement in 2010 were the same areas that failed them and their son five years later. How can Mr. Morgan, uh, Mr. Morton, Ms. Logan and the public have any faith in any new government review when the lessons have not been learned nor recommendations implemented from past systems failings, which, after all, is all that Mr. Morgan, Morton is looking for? Cabinet Secretary. Well, that's precisely why it's very important that I understand whether or not the processes and procedures that Ayrshire and Arm were supposed to have followed were followed whether that's in the, the Morton family's case or any, other, or any other of the cases that have been raised. I need assurance of that. And if they haven't been, then we will take action to ensure that that happens. The 2012 review that was the previous review uh, did establish some very, very important changes to ensure consistency in applying uh, the uh, significant adverse events. Uh, processes and indeed making sure lessons were learned and that there should be uh, standardised uh, criteria for, for example, referral 
uh, to the Crown in those cases that uh, were appropriate. Uh, if there are cases that have those processes have not been applied uh, properly, then I will absolutely take action to ensure that that is addressed. And I have offered to meet with the families once I have that his report to discuss the findings with them. And I would extend that invitation to the Morton family. Apologies to the members who couldn't get in there. Question number three, Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of reports that the Chinese company Sinofortone is willing to reopen investment discussions, what steps it will take to ensure that any investment is transparent? Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed, of course, to attracting investment and jobs to Scotland from China and elsewhere, but there are currently no talks scheduled with Sinofortone. We have been clear throughout that the Memorandum of Understanding with Sinofortone and China Railway No. 3 Engineering was about exploring possible investment and involved no legal, contractual or financial commitments on behalf of the Scottish Government. If projects involving the Scottish, the Scottish Government do arise, full due diligence will be taken forward in the normal way. The Scottish Parliament would scrutinise these projects and if there were any concerns, projects would not happen. The Scottish Government condemns human rights abuses wherever they take place. We are committed to engaging with the Chinese Government on human rights, an, official, an issue critical to China's long-term prosperity and social stability as part of our overall engagement. Respect for human rights and the rule of law is one of the four guiding principles that we set out up front in the Scottish Government's China strategy, and these underpin all of Scotland's dealings with China. Lee MacArthur. Thank you very much, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response, but it was uh, difficult to ascertain from that what he plans to do differently. Indeed, he uh, referred to the fact that uh, any processes in the future will carry along in the normal way. Can he tell me that? Has he looked again at the protocols he uses to assure himself on human rights and other issues before he gets the First Minister to put pen to paper? The First Minister said she would learn lessons. What lessons have been learned, uh, and is there anything different? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we would uh, seek to be as transparent as possible. And just in relation to the MOU that was talked about before, it wasn't published at the time of signing as it related only to exploring investment opportunities, not specific investments or projects. We have since released over 70 pages of material relating to the signing of the MOU and responded in detail to all 37 written parliamentary questions and nine FOI requests. I repeat, there was not a deal being done. There was a memorandum of understanding. Discussions were taking place. Uh, and that is the way that we would seek to approach, it, approach this uh, in the future to make sure that we are as transparent as possible and make sure that any projects which were agreed through the Scottish Government were made uh, available to the Parliament so the Parliament could scrutinise these projects as they progressed. Again, I'm, I'm interested and grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for his response, but there was nothing there that suggested the approach next time round would be any different. The First Minister assured this Parliament that she accepted that there are lessons for the government to learn and we will reflect on and learn those lessons. Can the Cabinet Secretary set out for Parliament what those lessons are for future deals? Cabinet Secretary. Hey, I think I've made clear in my previous response exactly what our approach should be. We would seek to be as transparent as possible at all times. It is important to realise, as I've said already, that there was not a deal being done here. These were preliminary discussions, as in the nature of previous administrations, which, which, which the member was involved uh, previously. There is a point at which these discussions are confidential. There is a point at which they can become public. And, of course, if it leads to projects, the Parliament's got a very legitimate uh, right to make sure that it's able to scrutinise those projects. We would make sure that all the actions that we took were consistent with being as, as transparent as possible and making as much uh, public as possible during that process. But it is very important that we have a government willing to go out and look for investment from around the world, including with China. And that's exactly what the First Minister and I have done previously. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Emails released under FOI indicate from previous talks between Sino Fortone and the Scottish Government that they were interested in energy projects and large-scale affordable housing projects and a scale of 3,000 to 5,000 homes which would be manufactured in a purpose-built production facility. The company indicated at that time an interest in Falkirk and the central Scotland area that I represent. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm whether this approach to delivering affordable homes is one which he supports? And can he advise the Chamber what role, if any, Chinese steel would play in these projects? Is he willing to, to rule that out at an early stage? Uh, sorry, apologies to the member. I wasn't clear what I was being asked to rule out. But in relation to the affordable housing... 
In relation to the affordable housing element, of course, this was not the Scottish Government building these houses, nor was it a project uh, designed to build these houses. Or to, um, all that was done was a discussion that was being had. And as the member has mentioned, uh, I think uh, one of the local authority areas was also involved in that process. We don't control the affordable housing that other parties want to build. We don't control that. Of course, we have our own programme in terms of affordable housing and also the ambition to create 50,000 new homes over the course of this parliament. That's what we are concentrated in. But if somebody else wants to come in and invest in housing, of course we will look to see how we can support that. Of course we will be concerned about the nature of that, but of course it would be between the parties which are contracting in that regard. And just to repeat that this project uh, was not uh, an agreed project between the, the parties involved discussing this. There were no projects, in fact, which were being agreed at that point. All that was being agreed were discussions. And as the member mentions, uh, some mention was made in the emails which have been released about possible areas of interest, but no projects were proposed. And it's at that point of projects being proposed when, of course, we'd want to have the due diligence that was undertaken and, of course, the scrutiny of others to make sure those were satisfying the Parliament's need to look at those projects as they were brought forward.